First, it was an article, then it was a book, and now the story is getting widespread attention on Netflix. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things Netflix is unbelievable got factually right. For this list, we're looking at all the things in Netflix's Unbelievable miniseries that are absolutely true. A spoiler alert for the show is definitely in order. Number 10. It's based on an article. And then he raped me. Honey, you need to be more specific. In 2015, T. Christian Miller, Ken Armstrong along with ProPublica and The Marshall Project, published a shocking article titled An Unbelievable Story of Rape. It told the shocking story of a young girl who was brutally assaulted and who subsequently had her story doubted by those around her. How about you walk me through it again? Tell me exactly how the assault happened. Again? One more time, yes. The article was adapted into a full non-fiction book called A False Report, A True Story of Rape in America, written by Miller and Armstrong and was published in 2018. Now it's a series on Netflix, which uses a similar narrative structure as the original article, being told in a somewhat non-linear fashion. This is very helpful, Amber. The level of detail you're able to remember gives me a lot to work with. Thank you for that. Number 9. Marie is Real Again? I already told the cop. Two cops. I know. Sorry. We need it for our records. All of this is based on a very true story that did take place in Linwood, Washington in 2008. Marie is actually the woman's middle name, and her real first name is not revealed in the article. These are from everybody. Some of these people I barely even know. I guess someone gave him my name. All of the details of the crime as they appear on the show are like they happened in real life. I'd do anything to go back and redo the whole thing, to just start all over and do right by you. I really would. Well, you can't. Marie's backstory, her history in the foster care system, and the abuses she suffered as a child are also real, as are the two women who were involved in her life who were her former foster mothers. Number 8. Rasmussen and Duval are based on real detectives. If the, if the truth doesn't, like, fit, they don't believe it. Who is that? She looks 12. On the show, the two female detectives who end up collaborating on the case are named Grace Rasmussen and Karen Duval, played by Tony Collette and Merritt Weaver, respectively. He proceeds to rape her for three hours on and off. I mean, same thing with my victim. Their names were changed for the show, and in real life, they're Edna Hendershot and Stacey Galbraith. Though some details of their lives and stories were changed for the show, all the essential information is accurate, namely that they worked together to solve the case by piecing together similar stories in their jurisdictions that Linwood Police Department let fall through the cracks. Everything that the police in Washington did wrong, the police in Colorado did right. They listened to their victims. They pursued the evidence, chasing every lead. They coordinated with one another, and they didn't fall prey to stereotypes about how someone who has been hurt should react. Number 7. Marie's foster mom told the police she didn't believe Marie. On the show, Marie's foster mom is named Judith, though in real life her name is Peggy Cunningham. She doubted Marie's story because she found her reaction to be out of step with what she expected from someone who had just gone through such an ordeal. The whole thing just felt off. Her other foster mom, known as Colleen on the show and whose real name is Shannon, also doubted Marie. And the story about them shopping for sheets and Marie losing her temper did actually happen. Seriously? You're siding with her right now? I'm not siding with anyone. Let's just choose some sheets and get out of here. I don't want these. I want my sheets. After what happened on them? If I were you, I would never want to see those sheets again. Well, you're not me! Peggy told the police about her doubts. And that's when their opinion started to shift on the truthfulness of Marie's story. You guys should have the whole picture. The context. Number 6. The male detectives charged her with filing a false report. After the police begin to see the case differently when they speak to Marie's foster mom, they start to interrogate Marie about the details of her story again. 
leading to her becoming frustrated. And they interrogate her as a criminal suspect instead of questioning her as a rape victim. They end up convincing her to go back on her claims and say that she isn't sure the rape actually happened. No. There was no rapist. No one came in your apartment. She eventually ends up saying she's sure she made it up. When she has to give a written statement, however, she says that she thinks she dreamt the assault but thought it was real. This is not what you just said. I dreamed that I was raped. When I woke up, it felt so real, I believed that it had happened. Marie, what's going on? She ends up being charged with filing a false report and has to go on probation as well as paying a fine for the resources used. Not only had they not believed a woman who had indeed been raped, they had gone further and they had punished her. They had filed a citation charging her. Number five, Detective Parker is based on a real police officer. There are inconsistencies in your story. On the show, Detective Parker is one of the men in charge of Marie's case. He is based on the real figure Jeffrey Mason, who was actually new to the department at the time, having recently been transferred from narcotics. I should explain. The problem is, uh, I've got nothing. He had very little experience with rape cases, which colors the case. In an interview with This American Life, Mason responded to hearing that he'd been incorrect in not believing Marie, saying, quote, it was so shocking that this had been the one thing where I seriously stepped back and questioned if I should be continuing doing what I'm doing. Yeah, you hear about bad cops? You know, guys who make bad calls or end up hurting the people they're supposed to protect. And I always think like, well, who the hell let him on the force, right? Just get rid of him. Maybe we should get rid of me. Number four, Marie's beach photo was important to her. How long did the assault last? On the show, there are several brief flashbacks to Marie playing in the water at the beach, as well as glimpses of a photo of her that same day in the apartment. In real life, the memory of that day ended up being one tinged with sadness, because although Marie remembers being happy while practicing photography with a friend on the beach, that same friend ended up turning on her because of her alleged false accusation going as far as making a slanderous website that revealed Marie's full name and identity. Number three, the way they caught the criminal. I want simultaneous timelines for both brothers and the girlfriend on all our dates. And have Selig call me the second he hands that mug over. I want a firm ETA on when I can see the results. By the end of the series, the two detectives have collaborated on their respective investigations, realizing they have a serial rapist on their hands. I need to be in prison. And the seemingly remarkable way this all unfolds is totally true to life. One thing that the show adds is the scrutiny put on male police officers because of how meticulous the rapist was in cleaning up the crime scenes before leaving. Christopher McCarthy, you are under arrest for multiple counts of burglary and sexual assault. You have the right to remain silent. The rest is all accurate, though. From the footprints to the DNA sample to the trove of photos found on the suspect's computer, which included one of Marie, absolving her from her so-called crime. I put all the photos McCarthy took of his victims into a file for you. Not easy to look at. I had to take a couple of breaks. Just click through. Number two, Marie sued Linwood. What? Who do you want to sue? Pretty much everybody, but I thought I'd start with the city. After the truth was revealed, the city of Linwood offered Marie a paltry $500 to cover what she'd been ordered to pay as an apology for her ordeal. Since that was clearly unacceptable, however, she eventually sued them just like on the show, eventually coming away with $150,000. They want to give me $150,000? No, they don't want to give you anything, but that is what they're willing to give you to bury this. Tell them I'll take it. In real life, though, she also sued Cocoon House, the organization that managed her housing situation, and won. This is because they threatened to take away her subsidized housing if she didn't formally apologize to the group and go for counseling because of the lies she'd supposedly told. Look, we can do much better. I don't need better. $150,000 is a lot of money. It's enough for me to get out of here and start over somewhere else. Plus, really, all I need is for them to acknowledge what they did to me. And this does that. 
Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Marie thanked the detective. Hi, um, I don't know if you know who I am, uh, this is Marie Adler. At the very end of the finale, after visiting the Linwood Police Department, Marie calls Duval to thank her for closing the case before driving away to her fresh start. I, I was calling to say, uh, to, to thank you for, you know, everything that you did. This really did happen, with Marie calling Detective Galbraith after everything was finally over. In real life, Marie had already moved away from Washington State at this point and was married with two children. I don't know, more than, more than anything else, more than him getting locked up, more than the money I got, it was hearing that about you guys that just changed things completely. She and Galbraith only spoke briefly, discussing the fact that they were both mothers of two now. While this story was a dark one, at least in the end, justice was served. So anyway, I just wanted you to know that you, you did that for me. And to say thank you. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.